we hiked our way through the weeds. It's really hard. I'm a city girl. I've never had to live like this. And to find the spot yeah, in the bushes. It's just, it's not easy for me. Ashley Drake called home. This whole area right here behind you is mine. But today, she's got to move on. Like I said, I've got everything pretty much packed up. Ashley has lived here with her husband for a few weeks in this makeshift commune near the Jordan River. I mean, we all did water runs together. We all, I mean, fed each other. The conditions are primitive. So right over here is the restroom that we've kind of made briefly. Just a chair and buckets. And it's hard for most people to understand how anyone could live like this. What brought you out here? Um, I did some jail time, and uh, then I guess my parents lost the house. Ashley's felony conviction puts her at the bottom of a long waiting list for affordable housing, and she refuses to stay in the shelter because... My husband and my dog are all I have. They can't all stay together. Without children, and they don't allow you, and they don't allow animals. Rafael Marquez also refuses to stay in the shelter. I mean, that's where all the drugs are at. But today I mean, is visiting a camp that comes and goes along Fifth South. I'm into, I'm into bikes now, I'm not gonna lie to you, but a lot of them come stolen, probably. Aside from the stolen bikes issue, Rafael recognizes the other obvious problem. So we gotta clean up after ourselves. Instead, that giant chore is left up to public works, police departments, and the health department. Along the Jordan River alone, we counted almost 100 between 33rd South and 41st South. The Salt Lake County Health Department estimates they've handled 1,000 cases in just the last three years. We captured one of their routine cleaning sweeps behind the Rio Grande on 500 West. Bulldozers, a truck hauling out dozens of shopping carts, and people scurrying to collect their belongings, even though they had warning. As for the cost of all these cleanups across the county... You know, and then the real expense is the waste disposal, the police, the peripheral agencies that are there, the equipment, the streets might be there. We're talking, obviously, millions of dollars. We return to 500 West the very next day, and already the giant mess is back. Sheriff Jim Winders proposed a possible solution. Designate an urban camping site right here that's safe, better managed, and sanctioned. He discussed the idea with our editorial board. And this is where I was a little chagrined when people, uh, you know, jumped up and down and said, what a crazy idea. But we took him seriously and headed to states where sanctioned camps are already in place. First stop, Seattle, Washington. You have your own privacy, your own little home. There's a communal kitchen. Not to brag, but kitchen's probably cleaner than most people's houses. Portable restrooms. You'll actually tell somebody. 24 hour security. You need to take a shower. Yeah, yeah. We, and a code that. of conduct for Seattle's Tent City Five. Sobriety, no drugs, no alcohol allowed. As long as you maintain the code of conduct, you can stay here as long as you want to. Here's how the agreement with the City of Seattle works for this camp the city leases the land to a nonprofit. The nonprofit pays the bills, including liability insurance, so the city can't get sued. Other camps, however, are completely independent from the city, like this one. The churches that we stay at... It's located on church property. So they'll let us um, come and stay here for three months. Alicia Roberts got addicted to drugs and lost everything. Her kids, her job, like her that, home. Um, even when you get sober, you still have a lot of piecing together, and that causes a lot of emotional, mental damage. She used to sleep in her car, fearful police would make her move. Now she sleeps through the night in peace. We have 24-hour security here, so we have a good relationship with the police around here. Supporters of these camps say the key to their success is that they are managed by the residents themselves. We decide things as a whole camp. It's more of a family or community. But not everyone is a fan. It's not a good way to live. And in our neighborhood specifically, the tent encampment is their self-governed. Tent City neighbor Cindy you. Pierce is suspicious of camps that are run by the homeless the and believes... I mean, nobody should be living under tarps. That's where Seattle's tiny house strategy comes in. This village for the homeless is located on church property. There are 14 tiny houses equipped with electricity and heaters. Well, these tiny homes cost about $1,500 to $2,500 to build, and there's no cost to the city because they're all donated. The entire village took only six months to zone and construct. And like the camps, a nonprofit one, agency pays the bills. The and while it looks welcoming, right? the goal here the and at well. the other camps is not to get people to stay. The most important thing is that it not be a dead end. So last year, 161 people moved into housing and over 100 people were employed. 
And so it's been wildly successful. The idea for city-sanctioned homeless communities started a little south of Seattle, in Portland, Oregon. We know that different types of sheltering environments work better for different people. Portland has three organized homeless camps, including Dignity Village. I think it's viable anywhere because it empowers people. Around since 2001, this is the longest existing homeless village in the country, and it provides much more than a shelter for longtime resident Scott Lehman. And with anything that a person earns that empowers themselves that they do, better themselves. Portland's newest tiny house village is much more controversial. It sprang up without permission from the city, and neighbors, well, they wanted to go. But Portland residents are getting behind an idea that may seem pretty radical. This summer, the city plans to plop down tiny houses designed for the homeless in backyards. So we've had over a thousand homeowners sign up on the interest list. The upscale tiny houses will have plumbing and electricity and homeowners get to keep them after housing a homeless family for five years. And we're looking at whether ADUs, accessory dwelling units, can be effective permanent housing. Right now, part of the problem is we're building two big and expensive housing units. Washington State Senator Mark Velosha believes these types of tiny house dwellings are the key to solving the nation's homeless crisis. If you don't have tiny homes, you won't solve the crisis. Tiny homes, villages, and tent cities. Ideas that are all out of the box, bringing people in, off the streets, and out of the bushes in Seattle, Portland, and at least 10 other cities across the country. We have a, a tiny home now um, a shelter, security, um, family, community here. Back in Salt Lake, Ashley Drake says she likes the ideas. As long as I'm not separated from my loved ones, then yeah. For now, though, she'll just look for a new place to set up her tent. Where will you go? I don't know. <laughs>